We're going to be looking at the Song of Solomon. Now, I want to warn you before we even get into verse 1. There are some serious topics in this book. And I'm going to even give you a greater warning. There is some serious intimacy in the book of Song of Solomon. So much so that, that, that little Jewish boys were never allowed to read this book. Matter of fact, there's so many intimacies in this book that the, the, the Hebrews tried to keep it away from their women because they might get excited while reading it. Years ago, I was teaching the teenagers in Bible school. And somehow somebody asked a question about the Song of Solomon and my response was, it's the X-rated book of the Bible. The next day, Two separate mothers came to me and said, Pastor Dan, I don't know what you taught our sons, but yesterday my son went home and read his Bible for an hour. <laughs> Folks, there's some serious stuff there. But because of the content of that book, many Christians avoid it. Many churches don't teach it. Many pastors won't touch it. Matter of fact, I thought back to the days when I was in Bible college, I don't ever remember there being a class on the Song of Solomon. Matter of fact, we had the survey classes where they take parts of the Old Testament and like, okay, we're going to cover Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. We spent forever on Psalms, another forever on Proverbs, a little bit on Ecclesiastes, half a class period on Song of Solomon. I mean, it, because the content of that book, there's so many things that, that nobody wants to teach. But folks, it's God's word. And I believe that the Song of Solomon contains the greatest teaching anywhere for relationships. It contains the greatest teaching you will find on dating. It contains the greatest thing that you will find on marriage and how to make that marriage stronger. So I think, I'm going to give you Pastor Dan's opinion now. I think it's time for the church to step up and look at the Word of God and use the Word of God to teach our young people what to look for in a relationship. To teach our singles how to prepare themselves for marriage. And to teach our married folks how to stay married. Because when we look around the world we live in, what areas do we struggle the most? Relationships, dating, and marriage. So here's what we're going to do. For the next few weeks, we're, we're going to look at this book. We're going to go through the, the, the Song of Solomon. And we're going to look at what it teaches us about how to have a wonderful relationship or a wonderful marriage. It's not just for married couples. So everybody that's not married can't say, Ooh, I can just sit here for the next month. Because there's great stuff in there in, in, in that beginning of a relationship. There's great stuff in how we date. So, so as we look at it, there's something for all of us. As a matter of fact, if you go through this book, here's what I found. It's kind of laid out like if you've ever been to a marriage seminar. The, the book of Song of Solomon is laid out like a marriage seminar. It starts with attractions. Then it goes to dating. Then it goes to courtship. Then it goes to marriage. Then it goes from marriage to intimacy. But how many today knows that sometimes the intimacy wears off? So then it goes to conflict res resolution. Here's what I found. When we look around us today, we look at the world we live, we look at the church today, we see way too many marriages ending in divorce in the church. We see way too many. And I think I've come up with one major reason why. As men and women, we don't know how to relate to each other. How many of you married folks this morning have already figured out that your spouse is different from you? I mean, they talk different. They walk different. They, they look different. They smell different. They even go to the bathroom differently than you do. When it comes to opposite sex, we are different. And here's where our struggle is. We don't know how to relate to different. So when something comes up, we don't know how to relate to what's happening in our world. <coughs> Say yeah. Goodbye. 
I'll find something more like me. So we need to look at God's word to see what it says. Now, as we get ready to hop in here, I, I want to I tell you we'll do things a little different. Normally what I would do about this time in the message, i say, okay, we're, we're going to look at, at chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. That's where we're going to be. And, and at that time, I'd usually ask you to stand. We're going to, we'd read God's word together, pray, and then I'd have you see it. Here's what I'd rather do. All this month, we're going to go through this thing verse to verse. So I'm just going to have you be seated. And we're going to take one verse at a time, and we're just going to kind of flow through. Because you know, Song of Solomon is a good book. And our teenagers, they don't want to miss anything in it. So, so, so we're going to go through it, and we're just going to kind of do it. But, but I, I need to kind of set a step here. I need to help you in the Song of Solomon before we start in verse 1. Because there's some things you need to know. Number one is, is the Song of Solomon is classified as wisdom literature. Now, to understand that, we've got to put, separate those two words. Number one, wisdom. There's a lot of rich stuff here. And we're not going to look at it just because it's the X-rated book of the Bible. I, I, I started to, to put on the team Facebook page last night. Come for the next five weeks, you hear Pastor Dan talk about the X-rated book of the Bible. I figured we'd had the whole side full of teenagers. But, but that, we want more than that. We want to see the wisdom of God's Word. But the other thing that we have to understand is it's written in literature, literature, literature. It's written like literature. In that type of form. And so it's written different than a lot of what we're, we're used to. You can't read the Song of Solomon like you read the book of Romans. The book of Romans, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What's that mean? It means we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But, but you can't take that and look at the book of Song of Solomon that way. Now, you're already chapter 1, verse 1. Stick your finger there and flip back to chapter 4 real quick. I want to prove it to you. But you cannot, you cannot look at the Song of Solomon like you look at, at, at the book of Romans. Because here's what it says in verse 1. This is the, the man's talking about his lover here. And he says, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast doves, eyes within their flocks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. <laughs> now, you get that? He's talking about his lover here. He says, your hair is like a flock of goats flowing down the mountain. <laughs> Guys, I dare you. <laughs> Or as we said in school, I double dog dare you. Tonight, right before you're ready to sleep. At that point in time when you're ready to whisper that sweet death in your ear, I want you to look her dead in the eye. Go, honey, oh baby, your hair looks like a goat. <laughs> See what that gets you. Now, I want you to understand something. Here, that's a good thing. What you do tonight, that's not a good thing. So we have to realize, we have to look at it in its literature. So we have to look at it in a different form. And for those of you who are thoroughly confused, her hair is gracefully flowing down. Just as the goats gracefully flow, flow, flowed <laughs> off the mountain. He's saying something sweet about it. He's talking about the good things. So, so we kind of have to understand that as we look at it. This is not like any other book that we're going to read in the Bible. The matter is some wisdom there. There's things that's going to help us in our relationships. So for the next few weeks, we're going to look at this great book. And we're going to, we're going to talk about different things. And today we're going to start right where it starts. We're going to start with our relationships. So you're in the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 1. And we're just going to start working in through this thing. And we're going to start right at the beginning. We're going to ask the question, who am I attracted to? Or we can go a little farther. Who is attracted to me? Now, let's start through this a little bit. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. This is the Song of Psalms, which is Solomon's. That's pretty self-explanatory. Solomon wrote this. King Solomon. So, go into chapter 2. Here she's talking about her brother. She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love 
is better than wine. Now, there's some things that we're going to have to look at here. And there's some things we're going to have to see as we look at the relationships that God wants us to have. Now, before we jump clear into here, I want to give you one. And the first one is we need to feel attractive. For, for that relationship, we need to feel attractive. I found a video, and I thought about showing it, but it, it was kind of long. But it was one of those man-on-the-street things, got went into a college campus. He's talking to, to college students. And he walks up to them, and he said, you know, there are a lot of attractive people here, aren't there? Yeah, I guess there are. Well, let me ask you, do you think you're attractive? Now, we're talking college-age students. You know, we're talking guys that, they, that they've been in the gym, they've been lifting, they, they're all muscle-bound. When we're talking some ladies that are college-age ladies, do you feel attractive? What do you think most of them said? No. Most, every once in a while you get this one, yeah, I think I'm pretty attractive. This one, you know, this guy, this girl standing side by side, and he says, do you feel attractive? The guy says, yeah, I think I'm very attractive. The girl goes, yeah. But most folks said, well, let me ask you a question. If we don't feel attractive about ourselves, how do we think we're ever going to attract anybody else? Well, we're not. You know, so, so, so we have to feel attractive. So, so I'm going to give you, we're not going to the Bible yet. I'm going to give you Dan's advice. Now, now, when it comes to, to being, you know, feeling attractive or, or making ourselves attractive, I heard a preacher say this one time at a marriage conference. I loved it. I've never forgot it. He says, ladies, I want to tell you something. Flannel PJs with footies in them is not attractive. <laughs> it's absolutely not attractive. And, and why anybody would think it is. You know, and, and, and so, you know, some ladies got her flannel PJs on with, with the footies in them. And, hi, honey. Good night. <laughs> But because, you know, if we don't feel attractive, and, you know, then what's that? You know, now different folks have different uh, opinions about, you know, should a lady wear makeup? You know, some folks will say yes, yeah, some folks will say no. I'm not going to try to change your opinion. But I do want to give you this thought about makeup. If you use less paint on the barn, you're using too much. You know, I, I see some ladies that I'm thinking... They forgot to take off the first 25 coats <laughs> before they put them on. Now, we can't just pick on the ladies. Because when it comes to being attractive, guys, if you've got coons hanging out anywhere, that's not attractive. I watched a gentleman last night. His underwear was to here. His pants was to here. And you know what he's saying? Oh, I think that's attractive. i raise your standards, please. If, if the, or if when you turn around it reminds somebody to say no to crack, <laughs> nobody finds that attractive. Now, I tell you that because when we feel attractive, then we're going to attract others. When we feel attractive, we're going to be attracted. And we take that to see what God's Word says. So, so it starts with, we need to feel attractive. But we go to verse 2. And it says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love is better than wine. If the dope thing don't work out for you guys, <laughs> next time you kiss your son, you just go, oh, better than wine. <laughs> Might work a little better than the goats. But what does he mean? Well, what is she saying about her lover? She's saying, a man needs to be sweet. The thing that she's looking for in her lover is she wants a man who is sweet. This lady is fantasizing about the kisses that she has with her lover, and she describes them as sweet wine. Now, we would know that as sweet grape juice. So, so she, she's describing it as something very sweet. And if she desires his kisses, she's talking about how sweet they are. Now, I realize some of us guys, we got on the slow train. And we've never gotten off. 
So we've just been slow through the whole dating relationship, or even the marriage thing. So guys, if, you, if you're like me, you're still on the slow train, I want to help a little bit. Gals like sweet. Guys like physical. We like the touch. We like the kisses. In a few weeks, we'll go on to what else we like. But we, we like the physical. <laughs> The gals like sweet. They like those sweet little things. They like those perfect things. That they, she says, his kisses is sweet. So as we think of a relationship, a man needs to be sweet. Not just the big old macho, me man, you woman. <laughs> Young men. That will get you nowhere. <laughs> Ladies like sweet. So a man needs to be sweet. So we think about it, but, but here's the thing. <coughs> Guys know that. How many married, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell ourselves now. How many married men here this morning already knew that your wife likes you to be sweet? Oh man, we've got work to do. <laughs> <laughs> we know that. And here's how I know we know that. How did we get the girl? Oh, we were sweet back then, weren't we? I want you to know something. The more I study for this sermon series, the more I know I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> because I realized here at this point that there came a time in my marriage relationship that most of the sweet doesn't left the building. Those things I used to, and, and, he, and it, it took last night to just nail it on me. You know, last night, one of the, the final things I did for the day was I went and I, I, I watched the parking lot as our high schoolers come out from a dance. I said, the preacher was there, and he saw it. I watched these young men come out, and they'd be holding hands with that special lady. And they come out to the car, and they separated like the partings of the waters, and he goes and opens his door and hops in and sits down. And I sat there as, as the old dad I am, and I thought, he didn't even open the door. Well, here comes another one. And he didn't open the door. And at about six, I'm thinking, I need to just get out and say something here. But then the conviction came. You know why our kids don't know to open the door? Because our sweet only lasted a little bit. So ladies, you need more than just sweet in the man. Because here, if, if your man only has sweet, here's what's going to get you. A few years down the road, a couple babies on your arm, He's going to be being sweet to somebody else. Sweet's a great characteristic. Guys, I'm going to give you a few days warning. The 14th is coming. If you haven't been sweet all year, here's the time. Get her something. It's better than nothing. Every woman can use a drill or something. Sweet is the only. But if sweet is his only characteristic, folks were in trouble. Let's go on to verse 3. It says, Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is an ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love thee? All right, ladies, it's your turn. Tonight, when you get home, and your husband has compared you to a goat. <laughs> and said your kiss is like wine. Just look at him and go, and you just smell like oil that pulled out. <laughs> but you know what's more than that? Here's what it's telling us. This lady is telling us a good man needs to have a good reputation. Now, I, I, I didn't think of this till last night. I put it on Facebook, and I asked in, in, in our Facebook crowd if anybody had a bottle of Watkins Linton. And then, the, just like rocket science, it came to me. 
I'm asking a Facebook crowd for the thing that great great grandma has in her medicine cabinet. So the closest thing I can come up with is Vicks Vapo Rubber. How many of you ever used Vicks Vapo Rubber? Know what it is? All right, young people, you are in for the surprise of your life. Because this Vicks Vapo Rub has just a little odor to it. Now, for their benefit, I took the lid off and I'm going to sit it right here. Because in just a little bit, what's going to happen? You're, you're going to watch these folks right here. And they're going to start getting a lift. And then you'll see it in the next one. And the next one. And, and by the end of church today, it's going to be about three or four rows back at least. Why? Because that smell just carries and carries and carries. And now that's some good stuff. But it's got a smell that just keeps on going out. The smell goes, you ever been around somebody, maybe he was at grandma's house, and, and, and all of a sudden, grand, grandma comes out, and you go, before you knew anything, you knew she done lighted up with it. Because it goes, leave it be. Because it goes before you. Here's what she's saying about love. She's saying, my man, it is going to be sweet. He's going to have a reputation that goes before him. He, we're going to know that he's not just sweet for the moment. Because of his reputation, I know he's going to be sweet to the end. The sweet isn't going to wear off as soon as he gets what he wants. The sweet isn't going to wear off a few years after he gets the girl. The sweet's going to continue because he has a good reputation. She, she describes it as that, that same heart, that movement that just continues to build and to grow. So guys, if the ladies were to put a label on you, what would your reputation say that you are right now? He's so sweet. Or would they say, He's a godly man. She said, sweet is not enough. A man also needs to have a good reputation. Ladies, what kind of reputation are you looking for in a man? That's how you build relationships. So we see a man has to be sweet. A man has to have a good reputation. Let's go on to verse 5. I am black but comely. Oh, you daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, look not upon me because I'm black. Because the sun has looked upon me, my mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. Now you're looking at that and you're thinking, okay, Dad, Pastor Dan, I don't want to pray to this one. It's not what it's talking about. But from that, we're going to see two characteristics of the woman that's attractive to the man. Number one, a woman needs to be a worker. Here where it says, you know, she's, don't look at me because I'm black. She's sunburned. She's been out in the fields. What's she doing? It says, taking care of the vineyards. She's been out working, and because she's out working day in and day out, she's become scorched with the sun. And in that culture, what they, they kind of the ladies kind of thought was what the man was attracted to was that pure, perfect skin that you'd never have if you were out in the sunburn. And you know, if you had been in the sun so long, you'd have turned your skin dark from, from being out in the fields. The ladies thought that wasn't attractive to a man. But what's attracted to him? Well, why is she attracted to him? He's attracted to her because she's a worker. Ladies. Guys like women who will do something. I tell you what, we live in a society, and it's not just the ladies. We are lazy with a capital L. Now, most of the time I'm bragging on our teenagers, but I want to tell you the truth about a few of them, since I got you here and everything. <laughs> on Wednesday, a lot of these, these teens will come, and, and we spend the whole evening together. Now I only have a handful of rules for them. 
You know, they, they're always in groups of five or more. Can't let any of them be alone. I've got to be careful with that. You know, they don't play ball in the church. Because things get broke when they do. But our big rule is, I'll fix supper, I'll buy the food, fix supper, but everybody that's here helps clean up. Some of our teenagers have mastered the skill of hiding or avoiding. And, you know, and they'll, 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 they'll form and somebody will say, okay, it's time to clean up. And you see a holy huddle of some of our teens. They must be discussing the word of God. I don't know. And then it doesn't, the whole huddle, they, they discuss it till all the cleanup's done. So usually I'll be like, hey, you know, you all need to be cleaning up. Everybody's been to clean up. So they go in the kitchen behind those closed doors, and they all form a group over there. I don't know how in the world you can dry dishes when you got six girls standing like this in a huddle. But here's what I know. What attracted this man to this woman was the fact she's a worker. She said, oh, don't look at me. I've been out in the sun working hard. And it's kind of like he says, yeah, I know. Ladies, guys aren't attracted to lazy. It will get you nowhere but the welfare line. A woman needs to be a worker. But from that verse, we see something else. A woman needs to be submissive. She says here, you know, why was she out working in the fields? Because her mother and her brothers made her go work in the fields. And she, because of that, she let hers go. She wasn't able to take care of herself like she wanted to. She, she wasn't allowed to, to keep herself all nice and beautiful. Because she would submitted herself to others. Now, we've been laughing and joking this whole time. But I've noticed something. I said the S word. And you could have heard a pin drop in here, couldn't you? So women submissive. Now, you know, when some everybody gets married and the preacher always says these vows, you know, to love, honor, cherish, and now all of those four, what do you think I get the most gripes about? Absolutely. Oh man, I've had ladies look at me in my office or whatever room where we're talking about them getting married, and I'll say, I'm gonna say this, you're gonna love, honor, cherish, and obey. I am not. <laughs> One lady says, Pastor Dan, is there any way we can take that out? So I turn to the book of Ephesians, where the Apostle Paul describes the role of the lady and says that, that the husband is the head of the house. He's the spiritual leader, and the wife submits to that. Now, that does in no way make her a personal slave. What that means is she's going to put her husband ahead of herself. And I say, so we're not taking it out. So it comes that great day of the wedding, and we're standing here somewhere in the middle of the front of the church, and I'll say, do you promise to love? I promise to love, honor, cherish, and obey. And about the time that young lady says, I love, honor, cherish, and obey, her whole side of the church goes, because <laughs> they can't believe it. But you know what happens here? This man says, I find her attractive because she's a worker and she's willing to put somebody else ahead of herself. She was willing to submit. it. <coughs> you want to know how to be attracted to a guy? Put him ahead of you. Think more of him than you do yourself. So what do we say? Man needs to be sweet. Man needs to have a good reputation. A woman needs to be a hard worker. A woman needs to be submissive. You know, Scripture talks about the non-submissive woman as well. I found this as I was studying. Great verse of Scripture. It's in the book of Proverbs. A contentious woman is like a leaky faucet. It says it in Scripture. So you know it's true. You know, drip, drip. So what's it saying? The non-submissive is good for nothing but getting on your nerves. A woman should be a hard worker. 
and submissive. But here, let's go to verse 7. Verse 7 says, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loves, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon, for why for, for why should I be as one that turneth aside to the flocks of thy companions? If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth to the footsteps of the flock and feed the kids beside the shepherds. And it goes on there for the next verse or two. But here's what I found. When it's talking about relationships, it gives us guidelines for the man. It gives us guidelines for the lady. But something else we see is relationships should not be secret. Or secretive. Our relationship should not be secret. Here's what's happening. What she's saying to her lover is, you tell me where you're going to be at noon. Because I'm going to come. And and what would have she wouldn't come to check up on him. She wouldn't come to make sure he was being a good husband or a good lover. Because what would happen were these guys would come and they would graze their flocks at noon and take a break and let the sheep rest and, and whatever. All these women would show up. They were the veiled women. And the veiled women would come and all the shepherds would go, ooh. And they would use these veiled women as prostitutes. You know, because that's what they were there for. But, but as they would come, this, this woman says to her lover, let me know where you're at, because I'm going to come. But baby, I want you to know something. When I come to you, I'm coming with my veil off. Because I want everybody to know that I belong to you. That you're my man. And I'm your girl. There's no secret. She want anything to be in secret. Relationships are not to be secret. And folks, I want you to know something. If your relationship is secret, end it now. Because if it's secret, it probably shouldn't. She says, I'm coming to you with the veil off because everybody needs to know that you're my man and I'm your girl. I'm yours. I'm not hiding anything and I'm not keeping a secret. Now, let, let me step aside from the pulpit for a moment. Because guys, I want to give you a little advice. We're not just talking about secrets in relationships. Oh, I've seen it too many times. The whispering wall. You know, every time in public. Well, folks, I can tell you, in your relationship, you know what that means? Number one, either you're not communicating at home enough, or she's talking about herself or somebody else. And all that needs to change. There should be no secret in our relationships. She says, I'm coming to you, but my veil's off. When you say you're going to be here, honey, I know you're there. I don't have to worry about it. You're not out doing secrets behind my back. When you tell me you're, you're, you're going to be doing this, I know what you're doing because this is what you're going to be doing. There's no secrets in our relationship. She says, I'm coming to you, my veil off because everybody's going to know. I'm your so we look at relationships. We see a lot in the book of Psalm Solomon. And maybe, maybe you're seeking. Maybe it's one of these young men. They're thinking, I need a girlfriend. Ask every married man in the place, and they'll gladly tell you, no, we don't want you. <laughs> but maybe you won't listen to us. We're old. You need a girlfriend. What are you looking for in your relationship? Some of you ladies, you turned me off back when I said relationship. I was so you have paid attention to the word I've said. And, and that just means you don't, it's not me. It, it, it just means you're more important than the Bible. I understand. But for those of you listening, I'll tell you something. What are you looking for in a relationship for a man? Maybe you're here today and you're single. And you're thinking. I'm not always going to be single. What are you looking for in a relationship? Because let me tell you the last truth I found. I found that we're attracted 
to those who are like us. Maybe as we look at some of these characteristics that we've looked at, we've said, you know what? I might need to do some changing here. There might need to be some things different in my life. We're attracted to those who are, it's natural. You know, birds of a feather flock together. You know, we're attracted to those who are like us. So when we look at, at who we're attracted to, and we're thinking, that's not what the Song of Solomon said I should be looking for, then it doesn't start with changing them. Because I want to tell you something. I've seen it, heard it from ladies, I've heard it from men. I thought she'd change when we got married. Unless there's Jesus, there will be no change. We're attracted to those like us. So, let's think about it. If we're looking for a man down at the local bar, what are we going to find? A drunk. You know, well, if we're looking for a lady down at the truck stop, back before I knew Jesus, never thanks. Back before I knew Jesus, we called plot lizards. <laughs> You're going to be attracted to those like you. So maybe what we realize is something needs to change in us so that we can have godly relationships. Maybe there's something in your life that God says you need to be working on right now. Something needs to change. If you're married today, let me ask you a question. If this was day one all over again, would your spouse be as attractive to you today as they were back then. Yeah. Good. Because here's what I realized. I let some of the sweet slip away. So baby, there's more peanut butter eggs in your future. <laughs> <laughs> who think the beauty is the outside. You know, we've all heard the saying that beauty is only skin deep. My grandpa used to say, let's skin her and see if she looks any better. <laughs> <laughs> but truthfully, where do you think your beauty is? Because if you're focusing on just the outside beauty, then today for your relationships, something needs to change. Maybe today in your relationship something needs to change. Who are you attracted to? My daughter was my guinea pig. She's the ones where, where I first started learning how to be a parent. And I had a say, when she got to the age where I thought she might be interested in boys, I come up with a saying. She's probably heard of way more than all the boys have together. But I want to ask you, who are you attracted to? Because here's what I always told her. If you scrape the bottom of the barrel, you're only going to get the scum. Who are you attracted to? You say, you know what? I'm attracted to the bottom of the barrel. Then any time for you to change? The relationships in your life. What does God want to do in that right now? 
Now we stop here at verse 7 or 8 because next week we're going to head into dating. But before we can start dating, we have to know what God wants us to do in relationships. So maybe today, God wants to change something in your relationship. I'm not going to tell you that for that to change, you need to come kneel to the altar. You want to? I'll show you. But maybe right where you're at right now, you just need to go to God. And if nothing else, say, God, I want godly relationships. Or maybe there's sin to confess. Maybe there's things to change. Who is attracted to you? Father, thank you for your word. Father, I pray for every person here and any person down the road who might hear this message. <clears throat> that we will take your word and we will make it our God in relationships. Lord, maybe today in this place you, you, you've, you've started working in somebody's life. I just pray they say yes and respond to you. Lord, maybe there's folks here that, for the first time, they've heard that there's a Jesus that loves them. And they want to accept your gift of salvation. Maybe there's folks with burdens and they need to bring that to you. Maybe there's folks that they haven't been walking with you. And, and it's time for them to return. Or Lord, maybe we're just messed up in our relationships. I pray, Lord, that each one of us listens to your word and the work of your spirit in our lives and says yes to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing page three, talk softly.